Tēnā koutou katoa, and welcome to those who have joined us for tonight's webinar. Hard to believe we're nearly a third of the way through 2021 already, with a long weekend to look forward to, and acknowledging Anzac Day as well. Tonight we are joined by New Zealand Physician Associates Society, who are here to talk on the topic of the physician associates profession and how they feel it offers a solution to the GP and health workforce shortages. Lisa DeWolf, Physician Associate, will begin the presentation, followed by Tiffany Hodgson and Jacqueline Satoris. You will also hear from several health workforce experts about the Physician Associate's scope of practice and their testimonies as to why they see them as a good fit for New Zealand. Very interesting. And I shall now hand you over for this evening. Thank you. Kia ora koutou katoa. Thanks for joining us tonight for the topic of physician associates, PAs. We hope it's informative and demonstrates what they offer to the workforce and how they work to support healthcare teams. I'd like to thank the mobile health team for allowing us to present this evening. My name is Lisa DeWolf and I am the president of the New Zealand Physician Associate Society. I work in the far north in Kaitaia at Tehiku Hoora GP Clinic. I've been living in New Zealand for five years and practicing medicine for 34 years. Um, my scopes of practice have been emergency medicine, urgent care, and family practice or general practice. Physician associates are medical practitioners trained in the medical model like doctors. The PA profession is rapidly expanding globally and ranks high on the healthcare demand scale. So PAs have the reputation of putting patients first, working hard and playing key roles on healthcare teams. Workforce expansion in New Zealand with this new scope of practice can improve job satisfaction, reduce burnout and it can really address the workforce shortage. It's really important that doctors, specialists, nurses, and nurse practitioners, and physician associates play a role in making positive practical changes that strengthen all healthcare roles. We heard some really significant news this morning, and hopefully that will make a difference um, for the healthcare system in New Zealand. Really exciting times ahead. So the physician associate um, profession um, started in the United States and it, the US News and World Report um, for 2021 rated it as the best, the highest ranked job in the US. Uh, Forbes magazine has rated the PA profession one of the most promising jobs for millennials. And the master's degree program where you get certified as a physician assistant has been num number one master's degree in, this, in, the, in the United States. So why do physician associates hold the necessary practical role? Well, if we talk about the global workforce shortage, um, there are 7.2 million health workers, um, shortages of health workers in the world. And that's going to increase in the next 10 to 15 years to about 13 million. Physician associates provide an additional team member and provider. Physician associates are a new scope of practice and do not replace doctors, nurses, nurse practitioners, or other health professionals or specialists. They complete the team and add to the team. So a new scope in our workforce in New Zealand is significant necessary and can supply several hundred workers over the next several years. Collectively, we can all help make this change. This will improve access, maintain quality of care, lower cost and reduce burnout. And again, it supports the existing workforce. So the New Zealand Physician Associates Society supports PAs and works to make positive change in New Zealand. We try to concentrate physician associate placements in areas where the workforce shortage is most vulnerable, prioritizing, prioritizing long-term placement. So 
we work to break down barriers that limit positive change in the healthcare system and educate about the profession. We are currently working to achieve regulation in New Zealand and work at full scope, and hopefully that will be followed by prescribing rights, which are really important for PAs to be able to work at their best scope. So we educate, we reach out to workforce leaders, clinics, hospitals, and health networks. We, su we will support and want to support the development of a training program here in New Zealand. This should happen after regulation. Training that's accessible for New Zealanders entering the health workforce and those that are already in the health, health workforce and want to um, do more than what they're doing. People with healthcare experience and a passion to make a difference, especially engaging those in rural areas so that they can go back to underserved rural areas and take care of patients and become PAs. Uh, New Zealand PA Society also advocates for all PAs working here in New Zealand, and we keep an up-to-date volunteer registry um, with our certification on our website. So just an overview before we move to the other speakers tonight, um, you're gonna hear about a brief history of PAs, um, how PAs are trained, where in the world PAs practice, where do they practice in New Zealand? And how do they benefit your medical practice? How are they utilized in New Zealand now and following regulation? How did your clinic go about hiring a PA? And we're going to hear from workforce experts and their experience with PAs and why they support PAs in New Zealand. So our first video will be Wayne Lim, general manager at Te Oamutu Medical Center. They have been employing PAs since 2014, and they have three PAs, one nurse practitioner and a GP working in the urgent care facility at their clinic. Following Wayne, uh, Jackie will talk to us about the training of PAs. My name is Wayne Lim. I'm the general manager at Te Aumutu Medical Centre. Uh, here at Te Aumutu Medical, we have uh, a staff of 45, uh, 14 of whom are GPs, uh, with a patient base of 14,000. Uh, we've had uh, physician associates at our centre since 2015. We currently have two full-time physician associates, uh, and we're about to get a third in July of 2021. So um, our history with PAs uh, came about because of the very well known shortage of GPs. Our desire to try physician associates on our staff as part of our provider mix came from the very well understood shortage of GPs in, this, in the country. Uh, so in 2015 we took on our first part time G, uh, physician associate um, and very soon after we tried out and got used to our first PA, uh, we went looking for a full-time one as well. So we've had two PAs in place uh, since that time. Uh, and as I said before, we're uh, recruited, we already have recruited our third and he will arrive from the States in July. And that's joining our mix of 14 GPs, um, one nurse practitioner, one nurse practitioner in training uh, and the three PAs. We really love physician associates because essentially they are trained in a similar diagnostic model to GPs and so communication uh, amongst the PAs and the GPs is very, very good. Um, our PAs are used to uh, working very closely with GPs, uh, that being the way they are trained. Um, and we've only had um, a lot of success with them and, and we really appreciate their part in our mix. For us, uh, the physician associates largely focus on uh, urgent care, mostly. Uh, we have a drop-in clinic here which sees 60 to 70 patients per day, uh, and that drop-in clinic uh, depends very heavily on physician associate uh, resource. Um, but uh, our P 
PAs also um, deliver family medicine via booked appointments uh, at certain times during the week as well, so they get a mix of work here. Clinically, they are very, very well suited to occupy a place in our mix. They are uh, a collaborative bunch of people, uh, very consultative uh, and very collegial with all our staff, um, and they fit in very well. We've, we're so um, happy to have them as part of our provider mix and actually would be really stuck without them. From a business point of view, physician associates uh, are a no-brainer in that they extend our GP resource uh, and our team capacity, which is much needed, uh, especially at peak times. Um, and from a business point of view, they are also uh, in a, a, a different uh, cost bracket to the GPs as well, which is a, a good thing for the business. I'm happy to say that Physician Associates would be part of uh, our permanent business model heading forward into the future. Uh, certainly our clinical delivery across booked appointments and casual appointments uh, depends on them a lot now. Uh, and they're so valuable to us and we certainly uh, support very heavily their desire to achieve registration in New Zealand and, um, and with that, their prescribing rights. All right, so I'm Jackie Sartorius. Um, I'm the physician associate who works at Te Aumudu Medical Center. I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about my background and training to give you an example of how PAs are trained overall. Um, so I've been a PA now for a little bit over seven years. I got my master's in physician associate or physician assistant studies, sorry, from Idaho State University in 2013. My first job was in Wilmington, North Carolina. Um, Oh, sorry, I got a bit mixed up here. Wilmington, North Carolina um, in geriatrics and internal medicine. After that, I moved to South Lake Tahoe where I worked in primary care with our indigent and um, underserved community. I met Tiff Hodgson while traveling to New Zealand on a surf trip with my husband in 2017. And we stayed in touch and she told me about the job at Te Amudu, So I applied and was offered a position and started here in December of 2018. Um, so. I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about how PAs are trained. So PA programs are an intensive two to three years master degree of year round study. Um, acceptance, re or acceptance requirements include a bachelor's degree. This can be in any field, but typically is in a health related field. Um, you also have to complete pre-med prerequisite courses. These typically include um, biology with lab, microbiology with lab, um, biochemistry with lab, anatomy and anatomy and physiology with cadaver lab, abnormal psychology and statistics. Um, applicants are also required to complete a GRE and CASPER test. The GRE is the graduate record exam and that's used to rank applicants. The CASPER test is a bit of a newer test and it's a computer-based assessment of somebody's um, kind of ability to, I guess, to handle stress and their situational judgment. So they combine those tests to decide if somebody would do well in a PA program, which is very rigorous and challenging. <clears throat> and um, they are also required that applicants also need to have direct patient contact experience. This is typically 1,000 to 2,000 hours of direct patient contact care. So that can be um, paid or volunteer and I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, PA programs are extremely competitive. For example, in the 2016, 2017 application cycle, of all the applicants applying to all the PA programs in the US, only 31% were accepted into PA programs versus medical school, which was 41%. And if you look at the individual programs, those acceptance rates are as low as one to 6%. Um, once you get into PA school, it's typically 12 months spent in didactic education, um, so coursework, and the remainder of that time is spent doing clinical rotations, uh, which usually comes out to 2000 plus hours of clinical training. Uh -huh. So my training, just to sort of give you a, an example of a PA you may meet in the future, um, I have a Bachelor's of Science in Biology honors from the University of Newcastle, and I moved back to the U.S. and got my Master's in Education. Uh, I taught science for four years, and the whole time I was contemplating a little bit um, whether or not I wanted to go back to school to pursue medicine. So I took an anatomy and physiology class and completed a year of uh, volunteer patient contact experience and then decided to pursue becoming a PA. So I left teaching, completed my prerequisites, 
I took my GRE and then was accepted to ISU in 2011, where I did my 12 months of didactic education and then 12 months of clinical rotations. Um, so this is just an example of the curriculum at Idaho State University, which mirrors, I think, a typical PA program in the US. Again, so this is eight hours a day, um, all year, <laughs> five days a week. Uh, so our fall semester, you can see, and then the spring semester, um, and our summer semester that was a little bit heavier. And a lot of PA courses in the US are offering Spanish now um, because we've got such a high Hispanic population in the US. Uh, so, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm getting over cold. So sorry for the throat clearing. So next up, uh, once that first didactic year was over, that's when I did my clinical rotations. So at my program, we had six six week rotations. So each of those rotations was 40 plus hours a week um, with an exam sat at the end to go over whatever the content of that rotation was. So my six rotations included family practice, emergency medicine, obstetrics and gynecology, general surgery, inpatient care, psychiatry, and then an elective rotation, which I chose to do in oncology. And some other common elective rotations are, um, you know, an additional surgery or ED rotation, dermatology, orthopedics, um, once that was done, I sat my uh, comprehensive final exam, and that's how I obtained my master's in physician assistant studies. Then I had to study some more and take my board exams, and that was a 250-question exam covering general medicine and general surgery. Um, in order to maintain my certification, in order for all PAs to maintain their certification, they have to complete 100 hours of continuing medical education every two years, as well as sit a recertification exam every 10 years. Uh, so just a brief history of PAs in the US. Um, PAs have been in the US for uh, almost 60 years now. Um, there are over 140,000 PAs practicing in the US, uh, very similar to what New Zealand's going through, but the US was seeing a shortage in GPs after World War II. So they figured that something needed to be done and um, physicians and uh, government worked together and in 1965, the first class of PAs graduated from Duke University, consisted of four people. And in the 1970s, the PA saw um, just recognition and acceptance by uh, the medical community and federal acceptance. And the 1970s also saw the formation of the National Commission on Certifying Physician Assistants, which is our regulating body. Um, and so what exactly is a physician assistant or a physician associate here in New Zealand? Um, Lisa's already explained that a little bit, but just to go over a bit more of what we can do. Um, so PAs are highly trained healthcare providers uh, who practice medicine, and we work within a healthcare system along with our team members to improve patient health. We work autonomously, but alongside GPs. So PAs obtain medical history, order and interpret tests, diagnose diseases, manage acute and chronic conditions um, from pediatrics to geriatrics. Uh, prescribe medications, refer to specialists, perform minor operations. Um, and the USPAs can uh, be a first assist in surgery. They can also manage inpatient care in hospitals. Um, in New Zealand, however, right now, because we're not regulated, um, prescribing medications, ordering labs and imaging, and filling out WINS and ACC and primary options, that all has to be done underneath our supervising physician's name. So it does sort of throw in an extra step and slow the process down a little bit, but we're all working with it well. And so far it's it's been working good, but we're pretty eager to get regulated and make the whole process a little bit more streamlined. Um, so what types of patients do PA see? We see any kind of patients, any acuity, any complexity. We're not just there to pick off the easy ones and leave the harder ones for the GPs. Um, we are GP extenders, so we share the workload. Um, we're trained to know our limitations and work within our scope. And if we need help, we'll work, we'll go seek help from the GP um, when needed. Uh, we are autonomous, so our supervising physician does not need to be in the same room with us, just in the building and um, accessible if we do have a question. Uh, so next up, we have a video from Andrew Lesperance. He's the CEO at Hastings Health Center. Um, he has a wide range of experience and knowledge. He was previously a nurse and has clinical training in cardiology and intensive care, as well as public hospital financial management. 
Um, he has an executive leadership, um, or he has executive leadership experience as well. And he's very enthusiastic about PA, so we feel very fortunate that he's going to speak to you tonight. Um, he is the CEO at Hastings Health Center, where Andy Cook, one of our PAs, works. Um, Andy is the only PA in New Zealand right now that's working at a certified urgent care center. She has previous experience in emergency, to medis emergency medicine um, and urgent care, and also was a PA in the Air Force back in the U.S., so next up, you'll hear from Andrew Lesprance. Good afternoon, everyone. Andrew Lesprance here. I'm the CEO for the Hastings Health Centre, which is obviously located in Hastings, New Zealand. I've been asked to talk very briefly about uh, physician's assistants or physician associates and why we um, have chosen to employ one and why we support the profession, um, which, of course, I'm very, very happy to do so. I think for me, there are three main things that I quite like about um, the whole uh structure and function of the career and the career pathway. And so I'd like to talk a little briefly about uh, workforce. Um, I'd like to talk about the fact that they actually do work. And I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the history and, and the benefits of having um, having a PA. Um, so in terms of the um, in terms of the workforce, we we have across New Zealand, as you know, and I'm, I'm in primary care. We have a significant shortage of GPs. Um, we have GPs that will be retiring um, probably, you know, more than 20% of the workforce over the next 10 years. And so that's quite substantial, quite significant. And we need to be thinking about how we find substitutes for that and how we manage to either get more uh, supply into the, into the pipeline in some ways. And there's a variety of ways of doing that. Obviously, we have physicians. GPs, obviously we're trying to train more. Um, obviously there's been a push in New Zealand throughout the last several years to um, create more nurse practitioners. I myself am a trained clinical nurse specialist um, many, many years ago. I, I don't practice anymore. Um, and so very support, supportive of the nursing workforce, um, but I see capacity in the system to absorb more and more diversity means that more, um, uh, more diversity of workforce means that um, we'll have a better chance of meeting the supply that is coming, uh, supply requirement that is coming down the track. And so that uh, for me means looking um, at uh, where we can go and, and PAs actually offer some of that diversity um, and have the opportunity to offer some of that supply. So that's the first part that I think is important. Um, in terms of history, I have, um, I'm Canadian originally, worked with, um, with, worked with uh, Physicians Associates in um, British Columbia and Vancouver at the University of British Columbia in sexual health services, worked in the United States at the Washington Adventist Hospital, intensive care unit, open heart surgery unit with, with PAs, and um, always found them really, really helpful, really, really useful. Um, and so now being employed and uh, now being in New Zealand and having the capacity to employ, I was more than happy to do so, more than happy to be supportive. Um, I think that they have great training. I think there's diversity of how they can come into the profession. So they have a lovely variety of backgrounds, which actually can contribute significantly um, to um, the diversity of the team um, and the knowledge in the team that you're actually trying to build when you provide patient care. I think that they're reliable. I think that they're clinically very versatile. Um, Obviously, there's a, an issue of cost. They do uh, potentially get remunerated uh, slight, slightly differently than GPs, so that's that's useful for the health system. Um, I think that they have a well. I know that we have a team-based approach here um, at our health center, and so I know they work well as part of an integrated health team, um, and actually provide quite a lot of cohesiveness to that to, um, to that to that. Um, supply of health service. They have great hands-on experience as well from my from you know from from my historical experience. The third part that I'd like to touch on is that they can they can simply do and get on with doing the work. Um, in New Zealand we talk about the Mahi, you know, they they do more than than, than talking, they do the work. Um, and so um, we know that they can examine patients and they can diagnose and they can treat. Um, we know that New Zealand is a little bit behind in terms of college for them and their, and their ability to prescribe, um, but they can still develop a plan of care. They can still do um, so much for our health system that um, is, uh, is, is essential for care. And so if you're looking um, for the opportunity to um, build your team, to have diversity in your team. If you're looking for the opportunity to um, consider costs as you do all of that, then I certainly um, 
encourage you to look at the PA workforce. So hopefully everyone watching wants to become a PA. <laughs> so uh, where are PAs practicing medicine globally? So PAs practice medicine in the United States. There's over 140,000 PAs there. In Canada, um, there's 200 to 300 PAs. And in Canada, PAs are also regulated, which is important um, in Alberta, Manitoba, and New Brunswick. UK has over 2,000 PAs, and the GMC is um, moving towards regulation for the UK, Ireland, and Scotland. Um, all of the other countries noted here have PAs, and of course now PAs are working in New Zealand and seeking regulation. So where are PAs currently in New Zealand in 2021? So these are the areas where PAs are working. Most of these areas are underserved and rural. And some of these clinics have more than one PA. And usually the satisfaction rate is about 100%. Most PAs wanting to hire, most uh, practices wanting to hire a PA shortly after the first PA begins to work at their clinics. So next we're gonna hear from my practice manager, Cheryl Britton at Tehi Kuhora. She's an experienced Maori Trust clinical manager, and she has the daily challenge of serving a large rural community and maintaining a health workforce in Kaitaia. Our practice um, has a lot of short-term locums, locum doctors, and so you can imagine why um, it would be important to try to get more uh, continuity of care and um, get PAs working there long-term versus six-month, eight-month, or 12-month locums. So we're going to hear what um, Cheryl thinks and how she feels about PAs. So given that Kaitaia is a rural area at the top of uh, New Zealand or close to the top, uh, we have real challenges with recruiting and retaining uh, permanent GPs to our area. At present, 70% uh, of our uh, general of our GP, our doctor workforce, is actually um, six-month contracted locums. And this is not ideal for uh, continuity of care and providing good primary care long term to our community. So it's ideal to have a stable provider workforce so that we are able to um, aspire to improving health, get better health outcomes for our community and the patients that we serve. As a result of our GP staffing challenges, which became quite dire in Kaitaia, uh, particularly in 2019, where the, all of the practices in Kaitaia were forced to close our um, ability to enrol new patients. And it actually became highlighted on the media with regard to um, individuals moving to the area who are unable to uh, sign up with a doctor and receive medical care. Um, this impacted the hospital services with patients going there seeking what should be primary care. Uh, so it was a real struggle. In addition to that, rural areas have a commitment to after hours service provision. We don't have facilities like White Cross and other urgent emergent care facilities that can provide for um, for care outside of the usual working hours. So that's quite a burden for the medical workforce and it is less attractive to uh, recruit people to our area. As such, um, because we do recruit a number of our doctors from the United States. Um, the practitioners there are very familiar with working with both nurse practitioners and um, physicians associates, working with them as colleagues and peers, and therefore there isn't the same um, patch protection or notion that they're a lesser clinician, that they're actually treated as colleagues and respected as such um, because of the training that they have. So we embarked on initially one of uh, the doctors that came to work for us. Um, his wife was a PA and um, she had, I employed her um, to work for us and that's been really successful. Um, 
PAs are amazing clinicians that have, because they um, have been down a medical pathway and their training, which is different to the nurse practitioner that's had a nursing pathway, their approach is very different and their ability to take responsibility for clinical decision making, I believe is, um, you know, is very comparable to uh, the GPs and as such you know um, you feel quite confident in their ability to manage patients. Um, the disappointing factor is uh, that New Zealand hasn't moved to regulating uh, the PAs as a profession, as a respected and acknowledged um, medical profession in New Zealand uh, and I'd really like to see that change because it would provide opportunity to optimise that workforce for us to then recruit more of that. Um, because in New Zealand, nurse practitioners was were hailed as the solution to the GP crisis. However, I think uh, my experience in employing nurse practitioners is that they're a nice supplement or they're a complement to the general practice workforce, but they're not a replacement for the doctors. However, we're unable to recruit enough of them as well. So I'm now seeking to uh, recruit and employ more PAs to have a more stable, permanent provider workforce into the future, uh, as opposed to um, we know that globally there's a GP uh, shortage. And so looking at what are other equivalent or similar types of prescribing workforce out there that would strengthen our ability to provide good care to our community and patients. So in closing, I really like to, actually, well, you can back this one up, but um, I am just thinking, yeah, in closing, I would implore the Ministry of Health and other regulatory bodies to um, endorse and support the ability to regulate the PA profession in New Zealand so that we can um, shore up our workforce and our provision of care. So when uh, PAs first started in New Zealand, the there were two pilot demonstrations and that's how PAs um, became um, accepted and started working in New Zealand. And that was in 2013. Uh, the pilot demonstration was commissioned by Health Workforce New Zealand, and it was commissioned to understand the potential contribution of the PA role to the existing New Zealand health workforce. So Synergia was also commissioned to evaluate this pilot study. The pilot study um, took place um, in two, uh, um, two areas. Um, sorry, um, focusing on urgent and rural uh, and a rural emergency department. The evaluation report focused specifically on um, how these PAs worked and the implications for the PA role in New Zealand. So the evaluation showed that PAs were safe, that they um, improved throughput and they reduced the workload. They fit in well in the practice settings and worked well with their peers and staffing um, clinic of the clinics. And the Synergy report showed that PAs were cost effective and that if you looked at the value that you get from PAs in terms of salary, the income that they generate from a business point of view is excellent and GP owners um, would um, get a great value by having a PA in their clinic. So one comment um, of the staff survey was that with a GP, NP, PA, and a nurse, an administrator, and a social worker, together as a team, they could cover a population of 6,000 patients, which is quite a few patients, and still be profitable. So um, the study um, proved to be successful, and then PAs were able to practice here under the same requirements that the pilot program um, tested. So um, the cost effectiveness and the fact that PA salaries are $50 an hour versus $100 an hour for a GP salary was significant for these practices. And PAs began to get hired in those clinics that we looked at before. So PAs are 
uh, less expensive, sustainable, and improve continuity of care with long-term placement, and definitely reducing the cost um, of having locum doctors. So what's next? Regulation is moving forward. We're working with the ministry. Um, prescribing authority would have to come after regulation. Um, we want to promote the role and doing something like this helps with that. And the long-term goal is of course, to train PAs here in New Zealand with a PA program. So Carl Metzler has been a long-term advocate um, for PAs. He's a CEO at Gore Health and he was one of the initial uh, employees for emergency department PAs and had several PAs working at their health center. They um, did real, real well there and he continued to support the PA profession. He he works on the advisory board for New Zealand Health Workforce, and we can't say enough to thank him for all that he's done for PAs um, in New Zealand. Yeah, hello everyone. I'm uh, Carl Metzler, the chief exec at Gore Health, um, a rural health provider down in the deep south of New Zealand. Um, I guess we first trialled the physician associates about seven years ago. Um, I guess our thinking was really around you can't fix the wing of a plane mid-flight um, and we needed to buy ourselves some hangar time, I guess, to repair the workforce being the, the metaphor, I guess, for the plane. Um, and it's actually worked um, brilliantly. Um, I would, I cannot recommend PAs highly enough. Um, we've had um, really good fits and matches for rural settings like Gore. Um, often the PAs have worked rurally and very remotely and, and in a solo um, manner in, in the US, um, in the far reaches of the United States. So um, coming to Gore for them, for many of them, was almost like a metro metropolitan city. Um, so it's actually quite a change for them. So um, they train in the medical model, which is, I think is a key point to make. They don't train in the nursing paradigm. They very much train um, alongside physicians. They train in the medical model and medical paradigm of diagnostics and testing, um, which, is, which is quite different. They are, however, very similar to um, nurse practitioners for lack of, um, in terms of helping people understand the role. Very much similar to those middle roles that work alongside and, and kind of under senior doctors. Um, and really they have single-handedly probably ensured the sustainability of our emergency department in a small, small rural area. Um, you know, uh, we know it is, I think, the second fastest growing profession in the United States. There's now over 140,000 PAs registered across the United States and probably another 30 or 40,000 internationally. So the profession's growing, it's spreading its wings internationally, um, and it really needs New Zealand now to pick up and run with it. We've been lobbying and advocating for the role to be regulated in New Zealand probably for the last six years. It's been hard work, but I think we're slowly making some progress. Um, but I think, um, again, it, it is, an absolute critical enabler whilst we grow our nurse practitioner workforce in New Zealand. Um, I know there's some concerns about being responsive and um, in terms of ensuring equitable outcomes for Māori and Pacific, um, but I think, you know, we, we have um, no choice but to hire a number of international medical graduates and our PAs are no different. Um, it's our job as Kiwis to ensure that our international workforce that's coming in um, is culturally competent and safe. Um, no different to any other workforce coming in from outside of New Zealand. In order to ensure that we're getting those equitable outcomes and, and making sure that we're advocating strongly for Māori and Pacific um, health outcomes. I, I mean, I think it goes without saying that New Zealand, particularly New Zealand rural health, workforce is on its knees um, and there are uh, considerable vacancies across the country and the, the PAs are really a um, tailor-made solution to some of those workforce challenges that we are facing 
And again, it buys us hangar space whilst we grow our own workforce locally with the likes of more doctors and nurse practitioners um, as they come through that pipeline. Um, so really, I would um, really petition central government to look at the PA workforce very seriously and to give serious consideration to getting them regulated. Thanks for listening. I really appreciate it. And thanks for the opportunity. Kia ora koutou. I'm Tiffany Hodgson. You might have seen my face on that poster uh, advertising this event. Don't worry, I'm not the main speaker. I'm only here to wrap up the last few minutes talking about recruitment. Um, I've been a PA here for the last 10 years. I was recruited to New Zealand by a ridiculously good-looking Kiwi, who's now my husband. And so I got to be a part of the original pilot, uh, worked in a high-needs clinic in Hamilton for four years and then Tiamudu for five. And for the past year, I've been uh, working at a busy GP clinic in Cambridge. And we have three GPs, three nurses, and I run the uh, drop-in clinic with the nurse triaging. And once a fortnight, I do minor ops, uh, minor ops clinic. So that's fun. Uh, so after hearing all these speakers and everyone sharing about PAs, hopefully you're interested in possibly hiring one. And so what next? Well, you can contact the PA Society and they can give you information on where to advertise best for, for a good quality PA. They can also um, send you our pack on a hiring guide. The, while we're waiting for our official um, registration in New Zealand, the PA Society keeps a voluntary registry. And so I would highly recommend um, making sure that they are on that list uh, before they're working here. And I'll tell you more about that soon as to why they should be on that list. Uh, you can also confirm their uh, US certification on that NCCPA website listed there. Um, and if you want help finding a good PA, that's my other passion. So I've been helping to just get PAs into the country for free on my own for the last 10 years while I've been here. But a couple of years ago, uh, we formed the GP Business Solutions, which is a PA recruiting partner. So that um, allows us to do this in a much higher quantity. And what we do is we bring in experience, meaning a minimum of three years experience in the area they're gonna work in, highly skilled PAs that wanna put down roots in New Zealand and um, stick around in these areas. And it's been really successful even through COVID this past year. So finding a good PA isn't easy. Uh, putting as it, It's not just putting out a seek ad and taking one of the first five applicants. We get hundreds of applicants um, from PAs around the, around the globe. And so a lot of them are specialist PAs. We, um, it's really important that you match the PA's specialty to where they're gonna work. So G, uh, general practice PA to working in general practice. We also want to match them with location, um, that, a location that they would prefer. So you don't want to put a city lover in Hokitika. Um, as you saw, PAs are also trained all around the world and utilized all around the world, but that doesn't mean they have the same training or scope. Um, and the New Zealand PA Society has advised that you hire someone trained and certified in the US or Canada and soon to be the UK as their regulation is getting rolled out. And the reason being is for four reasons. Number one, they're trained as generalists, so they have a real broad scope, and depending on who their supervising doctor is, they can work across general medicine, um, all medical fields and surgical fields. They're also trained at accredited universities. They take a national certifying exam, and then they're also um, nationally registered or certified in their countries, and they're required to maintain that registration, as Jackie told you about maintaining CMEs and um, taking exams every 10 years to keep their certification. So really robust training. We don't just want anybody get coming into New Zealand and calling them a PA if they're not, um, if they don't meet these qualifications. So uh, our PA recruitment agency, we conduct several interviews with the PAs. We wanna make sure that they're gonna be a good match for your team as well as New Zealand. Um, I'm allowed to say, you know, there's those classic Americans and then there's like the nice Americans. I can say that because I'm American. Um, we also do background checks, reference checks, and we have helped them with the visa processes and getting indemnity insurance, which is really important here. And um, because they're filling a healthcare need, we've been able to get them through immigration on a critical purpose visa through COVID. So that's been really good. And we're in the process of getting them onto the long-term skilled shortages list uh, with immigration so that that makes that whole process a lot easier. 
Uh, once you've found that PA that you think is going to be a great fit for your team, um, then it's important that you prepare the staff and the doctors for the new role and also just a really good orientation for that PA when they come in. It's obviously a new medical system for them. There's new health pathways and ACC and all that stuff has to um, be learned by the PA. They might be good at medicine, but they just need to learn what goes on here and, and how you practice. So in our business, we've got myself from the PA side who I've worked with about 20 different doctors over the last 10 years and you know having to introduce them to the PA role. And then we also have my business partner who's a GP and she's worked with four PAs. And so she understands it from that aspect. And we've created a orientation plan to just help that smoothly roll out when the PA comes. And you're welcome to have that for free if you want to email us. Um, our email is down there at the bottom. Hello at uh, GPBS. And yeah, get you rolling with a good PA. So last but not least, thank you. Thanks for sticking it out and uh, being here at our little talk. And most of all, thank you to Mobile Health for making this happen and to that long list of uh, supporters of PAs. We're going to open up for questions now, I think. Is that right, Kathy? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. What a wonderful set of team you are there between the three of you. Certainly very exciting. Eh? You've been sneaking around in the country for 10 years and then it's like, surprise, <laughs> <laughs> we can help you. <laughs> wonderful. Right, so we have got a few questions coming already. So the first one that we've got is RPAs able to work using standing orders in New Zealand? We do, the PA that's working in the urgent care um, in Hastings, she uses standing orders, but for the most part, we're prescribing under the doctor's name. So sometimes that's a knock at the door. Um, sometimes it's an e-prescription uh, with a discussion with the doctor later. Okay. Are there any rules around what qualifications a doctor has to have that they work with, e.g. do they need to be fellows? We, well, I think good, good practice is that they are a fellow because it means they've completed their training and then therefore they're um, capable of supervising somebody below them. So I only, um, yeah. Talk to the super. Uh, my supervising physicians are both fellows, and then we have a, uh, about three uh, registrar GP registrars at our clinic as well. But my yeah, I think it's good practice. There should be one vocationally trained doctor in the clinic that you work at, and then the others do not need to be. They can still supervise you. They're called secondary supervisors, and they're also on the scope of practice um, that we carry um, in in the clinics that we work with. Okay. Is it difficult for the PA working with no consistent GP supervision? Well, it is consistent. So, so we, we practice independently as far as seeing patients. And so if we need to talk to a supervising physician or have a prescription signed or review a referral, we would just um, talk with whoever is available you know, for that patient. And it's different because we're used to practicing a little more independently and being able to prescribe in the US. So coming here, it was a little bit frustrating at first, but um, as soon as the doctors here got to know how we work and that we know all the medications and we know how to prescribe, we all um, worked out the way that um, it can move smoothly in a busy clinic day and we're not taking time from the GPs and they're not and we're not making patients wait for a long time. So I think it, it works fine and it is a little bit frustrating, but but it, it, it starts to go smoothly as soon as you get to know each other. And we're trying to be adaptable. So I don't know if that question was around um, working with different supervising doctors, but that's how PAs are trained as you also learn how your supervising doctor likes to practice and prescribe. And so um, if I'm writing a prescription under a doctor's name, it might be a little bit different for this doctor than it is to this doctor because I know that they have different preferences. And most PAs that come to New Zealand have five, 10 or 15 years practicing medicine already. And that makes it a real easy transition um, to practicing here, just like the locum docs that come and work here from the US. And how many PAs are there currently in New Zealand? 12? Yeah, 12. Around 12 and a few more on the way at the moment. 
so there are 30 or 40 that want to come in and need jobs. So we're looking for employers and uh, probably a hundred more that, you know, are thinking about it. There there have been lots that have come and gone as well. So it's not just 12 from the beginning. It's yeah, probably 20 or 22 that have worked here at one time and 12 currently. Yeah. So around 30 total, but yeah. Oh, just little seedlings. Very cute. Yeah. <laughs> you got to start. Gotta start right? somewhere. <laughs> yeah. So where, are you, where or who do they get indemnity insurance with? So far, the sole provider of indemnity for PAs has been Medicus. All right. And then we've got... This one here, so let's give it a try. It says, where do the practices affected by generally rural health shortages see nurse practitioners working alongside PAs? Well, I work, I work alongside a nurse practitioner. Um, so, I, and I, I think it works really well. You know, we both come from slightly different backgrounds and we help each other out when we have a question. Um, she's specialized in geriatrics. Um, so if I have an older patient that comes in and I have a, a question um, about resources or um, just want to get her opinion and bounce around some ideas, she's really helpful that way. Um, if she has a um, pediatric patient or somebody with a, a fracture or something she's not seen that much with her previous experience, then she'll come to me. And I feel like it works really well. It's just part of the team, you know, just improving patient access and patient care. Um, so I would think rurally, just like Lisa mentioned, having a team of Nurse practitioner, PA, GP, I think, you know, that would be phenomenal. Yeah, it works really well. I also work with a nurse practitioner and we also had a, a practice nurse that was going to nurse practitioner school. So I was able to help the nurse practitioner student um, and she was able to help me with all the rules and uh, pathways um, that I needed to utilize when I was referring patients when I first started practicing in New Zealand. And then um, one, the other nurse practitioner that I work with doesn't have as much experience in emergency medicine. And I practiced in emergency medicine for years. So I was happy to help her with patients that came in with urgent problems. Teamwork, eh? That's mm -hmm. what it's about. It's about sharing our resources for the benefit of the patients we're all meeting, really. Yeah, it's um, all about the patient. Exactly. Absolutely. And so could you see New Zealand begin to recruit PAs from the UK with regulation from the GMC coming? Definitely. Yeah. A lot of PAs want to work in New Zealand and they're awaiting the regulation to do that. And so then uh, let me just try and put, so one we've got here is if you need a master's, why do you not do your nurse practitioner? Well, because you need to be a nurse to become a nurse practitioner. And people that become PAs um, typically have been working maybe as a paramedic or uh, HCA, and maybe they're a little bit older and they don't want to go to nursing school and then nurse practitioner school when they can just um, go to PA school. That's a different method of training too. You know, there's the uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Completely, yeah. Completely advanced different. advanced nursing model versus medical model. No, thank you. And so now I'm going to try and piece these two together. So bear with me while I try this. All right. So we've got here. There's the question I think they're asking is around the legalities of the prescribing under the doctor. How you work around that? So when you're writing the prescription, but you're prescribing under the doctor's names, how the legalities of that work? Okay, they have to sign off on that prescription. And if they look at it and they think that they want to write it differently, then that we would change the prescription. So um, they get used to how you prescribe and you get used to how they prescribe. And um, when they're emailed to the uh, chemist, um, the doctor gets the hard copy to approve that thank you and then we have a couple of people asking about PAs working in the psychiatric mm. 
side of things? Have you got any PAs working in that area in New Zealand? Not in, not in New Zealand, but there has been a lot of interest around that area because I know we're short in mental health. Um, yeah. But they do work in psych in the US. So it's an area that we're looking at recruiting PAs for it, but they would have to have a supervising position here as well. Um, yeah. yeah, and we have had a few queries from different places in New Zealand about hiring a, a PA that specializes in psychiatry. And of course, because we're general practice, we do a lot of psychiatry in general practice, but there are actually PAs that have only worked in that in the U.S. and they would be the PAs to hire here in New Zealand. And I think there is interest. <coughs> Okay, I've just got a couple of comments here. So someone, Pamela, is saying this is interesting and clearly a role that is desperately needed. Sad that it's a labour that a labour import situation with no pathway for Kiwis like me to become one. So I think that's someone that can is interested mm -hmm. in becoming a PA if there was a pathway within New Zealand that would support them developing that role. And then we've got another one. Hmm? Got yeah, so we have talked with University of Otago, and when regulation moves forward, we're going to work on uh, a PA program here in New Zealand, and um, eventually, probably too, um, there is a uh, accreditation uh, committee called ANSPASC that is um, has approved uh, what a program would need to be to be accredited with a medical school here in New Zealand. So a PA program, um, PA students would be with medical students in the medical college here. And that's the ultimate goal is training up Kiwis, taking those Kiwis in those rural communities that want to upskill, you know, do a two year master's degree, come back to their community and provide high quality care in a general practice or whatever specialty they choose. There's a, someone's commented as well that some you might find some nurse practitioners would also be interested in doing a bit more of that medical model, like diff, they do different trainings is what someone's commented as well. And there's just someone saying that, acknowledging that it must be quite frustrating when you come to a country like New Zealand and not being able to practice to the level you're educated to. And they're just wondering about how you manage this issue. But I get, you've kind of answered that, but yeah. Yeah. Just... It's, it's balanced with the excitement of pioneering a profession in a new country. So that's what, yeah, it is frustrating and frustrating for the ones that are coming over and, you know, have had such big, like such autonomy in the U.S. They've been sole provider for a lot of patients. And then now they're everything's done under the doctor's name. And it's but we're passionate and New Zealand's an amazing place to live. Why wouldn't you want to trade that for the lifestyle here? Of course, it's amazing here. <laughs> but that's that. Oh, sorry, there's one more question just sneaked in there. Um, there are also GPs from countries whose qualifications aren't recognised over here, and PA could be a pathway for them. Uh, more of a comment than a, than a question, really. But no, thank you very much for your time. It's great to see your motivation and your desire. I expect you'll get a few emails and questions and interest from tonight's webinar. And um, we've got people from across New Zealand listening in. So, yeah, this is awesome. emotional. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. No, thank, thank you for everybody. giving up your time this evening to join us. It's been very interesting and yeah, hopefully you can get your regulation soon and then move on to the next steps to grow their grow your workforce. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Lisa, Jackie and Tiffany, and thank you, Kathy.